everyone and welcome to the Exchange Symposium for 2021. My name is Sarah Campbell and I'm the Associate Director for Arts and Culture at the University of Exeter. This event has been a long time coming uh, as we'd originally scheduled it uh, for June 2020 and uh, it was going to be in person so we've, as you, like many people, we've transferred the whole thing over to 100% digital. So it's really wonderful after all this time to um, get together in one virtual room and share these projects with you. So we have put together a program that celebrates how communities outside the university and communities inside the university come together for knowledge and skills exchange and mutual benefit. And this is not to imply that this work is always easy or straightforward, but it is valuable and it is very much valued. So rather than one intensive day of back-to-back -back sessions, we have peppered our schedule over the next three days. And we hope that this gives time for reflection and also to keep other life needs ticking over in between. Uh, but we do hope that you can join us for as many sessions as possible. Now you should have received a joining instructions email that has the list of all the Zoom links for the symposium. So please contact the research events team uh, if this hasn't arrived. And a couple of other things to draw your attention to. Uh, we have set up a Padlet uh, for the session. So by going 100% online, we're very aware that we're missing out on those coffee queue networking moments. So if you'd like to share where you're joining us from today and what you're interested in, uh, do please check out the Padlet and please um, only share publicly available contact details as this is an online tool. And if social media is your thing and you'd like to share any thoughts and reflections on any of the sessions, um, our hashtag is hashtag exchange symposium. We are documenting the next three days in a couple of different ways. Uh, so we're recording all of the sessions and we'll be sharing on our YouTube channels afterwards. And we've also commissioned the wonderful illustrator, Laura Miles Boardman from Outdraw to create a visual record of the symposium as well. And both the links and the final illustrations will be sent to all participants in a couple of weeks time so that you've got a continued reference and you can pick up any sessions that you might have missed. And of course, there are a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, so do please stay on mute unless you've been invited uh, to ask your question or contribute verbally in a session. Do please keep your cameras off while presenters are presenting and you can choose whether you have them on or off during sessions. And uh, play nice. Uh, the online format doesn't always bring out the best in us. Uh, so please contribute respectfully and help us create a space of constructive and caring discussion and debate. And I'd like to finish my welcome by acknowledging the fantastic project team uh, who've worked to make this happen. And so this is a collaboration between several teams at the university arts and culture, public engagement with research, the MRC Center for Medical Mycology and Event Exeter. And we've also partnered with Agile Rabbit uh, who are providing the panel discussion tomorrow evening, uh, tech versus trust. So many thanks to them. So let's begin. Um, I'd like to open our exchange symposium 2021 by inviting Neil Gao, Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Impact at the University of Exeter speak about the importance of collaborating with communities. Thank you, Neil. Sarah, thank you so much. And a big congratulations to the whole team for putting on a, a mouth-watering program. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to, to join you um, and to start the event to really celebrate the hugely positive influence that we enjoy by connect, connecting our communities and the public, in particularly with university research. This is a really uh, important element of our research program. And uh, I'm also privileged that I'm going to be able to join one of the events that was just mentioned tomorrow. So I'm really looking forward to that. Now, um, of course, uh, this event is, is virtual. We're, we're learning a few new tricks, aren't we, in the, in, the, in the COVID months about communication, which some of that's actually very positive. We're going to be using Padlet technologies and, and, uh, and virtual learning and you'll be able to 
see some of the events that you might miss. And do encourage you to go to things that you're just curious about, because that, that's the wonder about, about the, uh, this, the exchange symposium. I remember it from last year that you can be challenged by things you had not think thought about previously and, and gain a lot from that. Well, uh, uh, the last year, of course, has been immensely challenging and has impacted uh, uh, us in, in, in very many different ways. But I suppose we now are beginning to see our way out of that period. And I think there's a reason for optimism that some of the impacts that we've, we've had to live with are going to prove to be beneficial to us as both researchers and as communities. COVID's definitely driven public awareness and interest in university research, uh, perhaps in ways that we didn't previously would have imagined. And it's created a kind of shift in the relationship between society and university, some very much for the positive. And if we can build on that and use that shift to really help our common agendas and to create new knowledge and to develop and reinforce actions, then I'm pretty hopeful that, that we can take away a lot of benefits from the stringencies and difficulties of the last 18 months or so. And that's really important for our, our future because we're still going to be facing multifaceted problems that, that, that challenge us all. And we're going to have to come up with solutions and actions. And that's going to deal with issues not just to do with, with health and, and COVID, but in to do with poverty, equality, um, clean energy, the environment, biodiversity, security, justice, all those sorts of things, the big societal problems which you can't do research without engaging with uh, uh, the public. And I'm always uh, mindful of the fact in my own research is that, you know, we are paid for as researchers from the public purse by and large. Most of it comes from that, that area. So the public clearly have got a right to understand our research and help direct it. And it should always be welcome because by doing so, we can deepen that kind of symbiotic relationship that supports research with engagement. And I've always found that that helps really shape the questions, sharpen the questions that we're asking and result in research which has got better impact. And it, um, by engaging the public, we can stimulate curiosity and get creativity, which we wouldn't otherwise be able to access. And that leads in terms to new findings, new research and, and, and personal benefits for everybody who's participating. So as part of that, as researchers, uh, the onus is on us to really make sure that we are continuously developing our skills in communication and, and to create opportunities for our communities to participate and to become involved with what we're doing. I strongly believe, for example, that every researcher should be able to explain what they're doing, no matter how specialized it might seem, and to be able to answer sensible questions from inquisitive lay people and to get their, their input to their questions. I, I can say quite genuinely that I think Exeter's got a very proud tradition of doing exactly that. Um, and you're gonna hear examples of that throughout the, the, the session. Um, I could give some other examples. So, for example, we're involved in a pilot catalyst project, which is run by our research councils to support and develop public engagement um, and, and the culture of public engagement. And that's a 10 year old program now. And that's really helped us at the university to uh, embed the, the, the values uh, and benefits into our research and to support posts that help us to develop those skills uh, and enable us to develop you know, areas of best practice that draw in direct benefits from public engagement. And we also created programs and networks and institutes which help to bring together different researchers in different communities around specific challenges. This is all to do with interdisciplinarity, isn't it? To, to get a wide perspective of viewpoints in, in, in uh, understanding uh, the specialist areas which we bring expertise to the table. Now, I, I started my, uh, my thoughts uh, in relation to the impact of, of 
COVID. And I wanted to highlight an example of our, our work in that area. And we've had actually terrific work here um, across the board in, in many different areas, not just in the, in, the, in the biomedical area, but in the social sciences, for example, and in humanities and in the business school. And, and one of our projects is the Soundscapes for Wellbeing, which was launched in January. And that's a, a partnership with the BBC and our Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments for Health. And this was really uh, an experiment to see how people respond to different types of digital nature experiences. And that has been shown to be really positive and bring therapeutic value to audiences who might be sort of stuck at home, uh, as we all have more than we would have liked to have been in the last months. Now, many of you will have experienced quite directly that you've had to adapt to the changing conditions of the day. And that's also, of course, been not just the experience of our public, but of our research community. And I'm very proud to say that our research community has been able to change and adapt its, its expertise at a really extraordinary pace. And we've been engaged in fantastic work across the board. Um, and another lovely example is this, uh, the Pandemic and Beyond project that's con coordinating and amplifying arts and humanities COVID-19 research, which is already you know, sharing expertise and creating new synergies for future activities. So I'm at the exchange, I'm delighted that we're going to be able to share with you some of the incredible work that's being done at the university and uh, sharing the way in which we're, we're going about this. And I, I know from my, my own experience, my own advantage point, my own research group, how important that engagement is and how it can affect the quality and the outcome of research. So um, I've always found it very important and, and helpful to take um, my flavor of science to festivals, to lay discussion for a public business uh, meetings, to schools and, and talk to school children and other public events. And we try very hard to make sure that every one of our students and researchers in our own field, which happens to be in a biomedical area, has got a chance to participate by communicating with the public. And my experience is that this is not just important, but it's a universally enjoyed by those people who undertake that activity. And also can be very challenging because you get a very fresh view from um, from people who are, have got an intelligent point of view, but not necessarily a specialist one. Also, I wanted to just mention that the role of the university in this context regionally, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Oxford said recently that um, universities have a responsibility to be a force for good in the world, clearly, but also to be a good neighbor locally. And again, we, want to do this and we make every effort to do that and engage with our publics and communities wherever we see it. And the university is creating a whole series of civic university agreements, which we set out to enable us to work together to enhance and enrich you know, economy, the society, the environment. And that spans all of our campuses across Devon, um, Exeter and Cornwall. And that will also enable us to enhance our student experience and enrich our academic practice and have a very positive impact, uh, uh, impact on the region that we're very proud to represent. So um, while we, for the meantime, remain in the online world, I hope that this, this event will, is also gonna demonstrate to you that we are connecting with people, we're sharing ways in which we can benefit from all the fantastic knowledge base which is a, a major community resource here at Exeter and across the university. And I truly hope and definitely expect that you're going to be thrilled and enjoy the sessions. You're gonna learn new things. And I hope you'll also take this opportunity to share and help us to work with you to continue those conversations for a better future. So have a fantastic exchange symposium and uh, a wonderful next few days. Lovely. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, and um, as, a, as a side plug, um, uh, I was fortunate
be asked uh, to support the Centre for Medical Mycology has a podcast series called Fungi Cast. And uh, I discussed fungi with Neil and Merlin Sheldrake. And the point that Neil makes about communicating a sort of depth of knowledge of a subject in a way that can be grasped. Um, I, Neil does that incredibly well. And uh, it is fascinating, uh, the world of fungi. If you haven't been um, caught by that particular bug yet, I recommend it very highly. Um, so thank you. Um, so I would now like to invite Martha Wilkinson, CEO of Devon Communities Foundation, to speak about the importance of collaborating with university researchers. So thank you, Martha. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me um, to the beginning of your symposium. I think it's so important that we share this fascinating and creative work because, in fact, as we were talking just before this started, the importance of thinking space, of sparking a new idea is, is really vital and actually very precious and quite rare in the um, humdrum of business as usual. So here's a great opportunity to think a bit differently. I'm the Chief Executive of Devon Community Foundation. We're an independent charitable foundation. We have 25 years history of supporting communities in Devon to grow and thrive by investing in local voluntary and community social enterprise organisations and partnerships. Recently, we were delighted to work with the University X to do some research into um, how the university engages with voluntary community and social enterprise organisations. And we really believe that people within communities and within these very local, often hyper-local organizations often hold the key to some solutions to really huge problems. Of course, I couldn't agree more, Neil, that last year has been, a has been challenging in the extreme for everybody. In many cases, this has meant isolation, deep stress, increased mental health issues and hunger. Communities have been magnificent in rising to the challenge of standing shoulder to shoulder with those most in need of support. And that, of course, is what they do day in, day out, everywhere, often completely unnoticed. I also agree that the role of academic expertise has become real for us all in a way that just simply wasn't true for those outside academia before. And this offers a unique opportunity to connect society and the university in new ways. Who would have thought that we would all be glued to our charts, become experts in um, the COVID variants or the R rate or watch scientists on our even, evening news each night? Exeter University must be doing something right because I can barely turn on the radio without hearing from somebody from the university talking brilliantly about fascinating and diverse subjects. Um, and I think the insight into that kind of thinking is very powerful for us who are not academics. I really welcome that shift in relationship between society and academic expertise and the renewed commitment of the University of Exeter to Devon and Cornwall and the region. This is extremely pertinent given the past year where the various strengths of different parts of our society have come together in common purpose. We have so many common agendas and the potential to work together to create new forms of knowledge is exciting and it has the potential to be genuinely transformative. Devon and Cornwall have a rich and diverse voluntary sector that is enthusiastic about working with the University of Exeter. Students are similarly attracted to working with VCSE organisations. There are some excellent current examples of collaboration, some of which you'll be hearing about over the next coming days. But that collaboration is within organisations, between individuals, within strategic conversations and in exploring how much more could be done. But often we, the VCSE voluntary sector, don't know what we don't know. A few years ago, we at Devon Community Foundation benefited from our first student placement, a data analyst. At DCF, we have data coming out of our ears and we wanted to be able to turn that into insight in a few ways. So my deputy and I sat one morning and we thought up the most difficult things we could think of, the questions we wanted answering, ways of arranging data we wanted in order to give our placement really challenging um, opportunities to make a difference, keeping really busy for a week. The day arrived, our student arrived and we briefed him. He was completed on all the things we'd asked him to do by lunchtime of the following day. 
He then went on to show us how we might be able to think and learn differently. Not only did he have a skill set way beyond anything that we had, but he was also of a different generation and that was important. We were almost literally on different planets in terms of an understanding of what could be done. Boy, did we learn. And that was an incredibly exciting process. I believe he also really enjoyed uh, showing us what was what, demonstrating his great skill and knowledge, and perhaps he hadn't ever realized before how much he had to offer. Now, of all times, so much has been learned over the course of the last year, and we all, in our different ways, have a great deal to think and talk about. Universities are seen as neutral spaces in which to have those conversations. Convening, credibility, and independence are the great gift that you offer to community. Often, community groups are experts in their own worlds. Their knowledge and the insight they have gained can be invaluable in putting nuance and depth into theoretical discussions. I have often thought that our communities are like little laboratories in themselves. Local people know why and how things happen. Groups and organizations who know stuff and want to be able to demonstrate their knowledge often need some support from researchers and students to be able to demonstrate their credibility and benefit from the rigor of academic study. Likewise, students and universities really benefit from being exposed to the real world and begin to understand the messiness of community life and community action. You also don't always know what you don't know. In order for this to progress further, there is a need for more coordination and better mutual understanding to make the most of this largely untapped resource. I'm afraid that I have always thought of the University of Exeter as a bit of an octopus. You never know which tentacle you're talking to. We need a simpler way of engaging than talking to all the tentacles. Making that happen, going further, faster and deeper needs institutional backing and clout. I really congratulate you for already being on that journey, but there is more to do. Collaborations have to be structured in such a way that they genuinely feel like partnerships on an organizational level and not fall into the trap of feeling like largesse on some, of, on some levels. All the expertise, be it academic or experiential, need to be given equal weight. The university, because of its size and scale, will always by default be the dominant power in a partnership. And, and really it's important to be very self-aware of that and mitigate as a matter of course. No one likes to be patronized. As you said, Neil, we have some very big challenges to face around poverty, health, aging, and inequalities to name just a few. And it's great to have the University of Exeter alongside us, the VCSE, in these conversations. My team and I have a misty-eyed vision of the future. If we do this right, together, this could lead to a really exciting future where communities and academics work together to identify common research priorities and carry out collaborative research across the region. And then as students are introduced to the strengths and diversity of the VCSE sector in Devon and Cornwall and see how much they have to offer. So they might choose to remain in the region after graduation and continue to co contribute to its success to the great benefit of us all. Thank you. Getting to my buttons. Uh, thank you very much, Martha. That was fantastic and uh, you raised brilliant points and also very strong calls to action as well. I um, agree entirely uh, about the importance of communication and uh, the octopus uh, with its many tentacles is a, is a great description. And uh, a point that I, I think is really important to raise at the top as well is power dynamics and scale and an awareness of um, uh, the size of, of the institution such as the university and, and working meaningfully and having parity of voice um, to really find that that middle point and um, the tension between the ambitions and the reality the mess of real life and and the tidiness of the page and um, and uh, so there is a lot of striving and there's always more that can be done and um, 
from hearing both Martha and Neil speak, uh, particularly about the huge global issues and uh, changes that have been going on over the last, well, forever, but particularly over the last 18 months. Um, I think hopefully it's demonstrated to us that, you know, as a species, we need each other across the board. And, um, uh, and this is a way of uh, bringing our knowledges together for, for benefits. So um, uh, it's really rich space. And thank you both very much for setting us up and kind of setting the frame and the space for what we're going to be talking about over the next few days. Um, and from that mode, uh, we're going to be moving into uh, specific projects. So I hope uh, for you as an audience, you'll get a sense of when we bring that right down to sort of individuals coming together and working together, uh, have an understanding of the range of ways um, that uh, different projects have been happening. So um, what I'd like to do now is hand over to um, our keynotes. So we have artist uh, Pete Ward, and Dr. Joni Willett, who is the Senior Lecturer in Politics at the University of Exeter in Penryn, and they'll be sharing insights into their amazing Painting a Parish Future collaboration. So Joni, I have you up on screen, welcome. Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> I get my video, there we go. It's really weird. I don't know. I, this it's been well over a year now since um since we we're all online and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I still can never remember to unmute my microphone, which is uh which is a bit tragic, isn't it? Hi Pete, how are you doing? I'm all right. I can't see I can't see if I'm on the screen. I can see you. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. Pete and Joni, you're both up on the screen. And... I can't frame myself quite right here at the moment. So I don't know what I'm looking like. So uh... <laughs> These things are so important. Um, uh, I'm hoping that everybody can see our, um, can see the PowerPoint. And what I'm also yeah. going to do is I'm going, hopefully. Joni, can you, sh can you shift it to a full screen um, for your PowerPoint? At the moment, we've got the, the upcoming slides showing down the left. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, hang on, I'm also going to post a, um, I'm going to post a link in the chat. So hopefully everybody can, um, everybody will be able to see the link. I've got it, I'm just going to full screen. There we go, that should be all on. Right, yeah. what I'm hoping is that, um, that you can all see the Padlet that we've got, um, the link to the Padlet that I've just popped into the chat there. And the, um, and the idea is that as we're going through, um, as we're going through our, our discussion um, this morning, if there's any thoughts and ideas and um, or links or images that spring to mind, um, pop it onto the Padlet. Literally, there's a little plus side on the right hand side of the page. And if you click on that plus side, um, that plus sign that will um, take you through the very, very simple things to be able to share stuff. And what we were hoping is that people can be having a bit of a conversation about what we're talking about, um, about what we're discussing, you can be having a conversation onto the Padlet. And then when we've kind of gone through our conversation, because this is going to be a conversation really, because actually that's how it all emerged. So, um, uh, and when Pete and I have stopped talking about the projects that we've been working on and stuff like that, then um, you and then then we can look at the Padlet and see what you've been discussing, and we can make it have a bigger discussion altogether. Anyways, that's the logistics. Um, uh, I just want to introduce ourselves really, really briefly. So I am Joni Willett. I'm a senior lecturer in politics with um, a really big interest in um, in communities but for a whole number of different reasons. Communities are fascinating at the best of times, but also um, I'm really interested in redevelopment, how we make out in the policy terms right now, it's kind of leveling up, but, um, but these kind of questions about how we can even out regional inequalities it also takes me to do a lot of stuff around local government. Um, yeah, so that's me. And, I just want, and now I'm going to pass you over to Pete, who's going to introduce himself. Please. Hello there. Um, I'm Pete Ward. I'm a, well, 
it's funny calling yourself an ecological artist now because I think all artists are, are kind of dealing with with these issues now there isn't doesn't seem to be a separation anymore um I'm presently sitting in St Ives in um Porthmere Studios which are some of the oldest artist studios in England um, I'm looking out of the window here at a beautiful turquoise ocean um, and the waves are lapping gently on the shore. It's quite nice really, but it's my last day here. Um, my work has basically been for the last 12 years looking into um, earth pigments. Um, and I gather and collect my own earth pigments and make paintings, get run workshops um, and get involved with other projects such as this one around this. And I think what, what that's really taught me is how interdisciplinary art projects can just enrich and teach our lives so much. Art isn't about a product at the end of the day, it's about the process that we, we go through along that way and that opens up so many different possibilities. Um, so I've been working with geologists, with social historians, with politics lecturers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it just, um, yeah, it's just highlighted to me the sort of scope of the arts within, within all this, but, but also how we can work together with scientists and things along the way. Um, you think of anything else I can say? And the picture on, on the, the left there, this was a, a lockdown project um, to do with, with body painting, which is one of the sort of most primitive forms of art that we can do. So, so during lockdown, I decided to cover myself with earth pigments on a daily basis and post photographs of myself online. It was all sort of in a way of transforming and looking at our identity and our connection to the land. Um, so yeah, it was great fun. Anyway. Um, I'm also really aware. So, so we're, we're, we're having a chat last week and we're thinking about, okay, how are we going to organize this talk? Um, and the thing that's really, um, that really is striking for me is about the way the our collaboration, which is, I don't know, how long have we been working together? Is it, it's got to be three years um, now? Years and years, three years, yeah, 2008, wasn't it, I think, yeah. Um, In about uh, April, April, May 2008, so yeah, three years. Um, uh, yeah, so we've been working together now for a number of years, but... Um, our collaboration, if you like, or joint working or whatever, um, it's really hard to put it into this kind of linear format. Um, and so there's like all of these threads that we want to share with you. And it's like, which one do we pull out? And how does that all kind of make sense? So when we were discussing how to arrange these threads um, last week, um, we started in a place that actually I was quite surprised at, but I personally, I think, for me, this is one of the things about um, about our collaboration is about the way that um, that uh, academics can be so focused and like so not I want to, don't want to call us narrow because we're not you know but we can be really really focused and focus on outcomes as well and like what are we gonna what are we trying to achieve from this stuff and all of that kind of thing, but um, which must drive Pete round the bend sometimes, um, but. <laughs> But one of the things that I absolutely adore about the kind of conversations that we have is that they start in different places and they end up in different places. And that, for me, is really enriching. But our conversation last week started off, I'm trying to move to the next slide. It doesn't want to. There we go. We have it. Our conversation last week started off here, um, which is which is hu also hugely relevant for some of the kinds of conversations and some of the kinds of questions that we're playing with really, um, uh, regardless of whatever kinds of work that we're doing. You know, Pete, if you want to sort of start pulling on this thread. Oh, blimey. Yeah, and being in, being in St Ives, um, it has uh, been quite an eye opener. But I think for me, what this slide says, is just the sort of, I guess the motivation behind a lot, a lot of our work, the, the G7 very much highlighted so many of the issues that, that we're facing sort of socially, ecologically. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's why this slide is here, Joni, is that it, it's a way of like looking at the things. I mean, being in St. Ives for G7 week and around that time, um, we had armed police on the street. We had jet fighters being refueled for a fortnight over the top of us under this sort of greenwashed um, idea of that this was a carbon neutral 
um, conference that was going on in this town and um, in a very, very impoverished part of the country in West Cornwall, um, basically local businesses were shut down for two weeks um, without any recompense at all for businesses in this part of the world. I know in Falmouth it was slightly different and um, just the di disruption to this sort of small part of the world. Um, and yet with the pretense of talking about helping environmental issues um, and it's obviously an area that me and Joni are, are very, very, um, yeah, it's very important to us, I guess, it is all that we can say and the, the passion that involved in different ways from both of us, um, I guess, is why we met, well, our, our project basically started at a meeting, a melting pot meeting at the Creative Exchange at the Environment and Sustainability Institute in Penry. Um, and somehow we started, we sat on a sofa next to each other and started chatting um, and realised that we shared a lot of ideas, but also we had very, very different ideas and we were coming from very, very different directions. Um, yeah, I mean, sitting here last week, out there, there was a 7.6 billion pound aircraft carrier sitting outside my window, um, which I don't know what everybody believes, but I don't really feel that that's a very appropriate action to take at this time. Um, but there you go. Um, what, what was your feelings about the G7? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think one of the things, and um, I'm just, I, I'm kind of trying to work out or just decide with myself whether to um, go move on to the next slide because the two kind of work really closely in tandem, I feel. I have gone mm. to the next slide. And, and this is the way the, um, our conversation about the G7 um, and all of that military hardware and you know, people moving around the world and what that represents um, uh, kind of made me think about, it made me think really, really heavily, which you know, our, our collaboration makes me think a lot about actually, is about the divorce between, um, between people and the environments that we're sat in. We talk about we um, uh, we talk about how important the environment is to us, and how um, uh, you know how I don't know. We want more green spaces and all of this kind of stuff. But it one of the things our collaboration really really makes me makes me personally reflect on a lot is about the way that actually we we're, we're divorced humans. You know that. Humans are completely divorced from the natural environment in so many different ways. I mean, this um, uh, this is Times Square um, in New York, um, and you know, which you know, it's it's just so good as like a, as epitomizing epitomizing consumerism, um, technology. Um, um, there, there is some green stuff, and actually New York City has quite a bit of green stuff in it as well, around the edges and in the middle of the park. But, uh, you know, green, green pots, but even the green stuff is really heavily managed. It's not tangled, it's not lively, it's, it's sort of, it's controlled. And, um, uh, and, and obviously the G7, or one of the things that the G7, um, one, one of the things that was on the agenda was the environment, which was fantastic. And it was really, really amazing to see so many different environmental groups getting together, trying to you know, make sure that that's, you know, that's very, very present on a global level. It was fantastic to see Mount Recycle More, that, um, that uh, sculpture out of, that was made out of um, electronic waste, All really, really good. But um, I was, for me personally, I was kind of questioning um, whether the way that we're imagining the environment and the way that we imagine our relationship to, with the environment, whether that actually tackles the way that we've kind of separated that, ourselves out. We're different to it. You know, it's, it's not even part of us. And I think one of the things I love about Pete's work is about the way that he's painting with the earth. You know, it's, it's, it, he mentioned earlier about how it's really, you know, that body painting, for example, is the body painting with pigments made from your locality is a really, it's, you know, that's a, a really basic form of painting. Um, but at a molecular level, it makes me reflect 
very heavily about the way that actually, you know, the molecules that make up me come from my environment, comes from the things around me. I'm, if I live in a city like New York, then literally, you know, I end up ingesting and becoming fabricated from the, you know, I don't know, all of the stuff that goes on. Anyway, I've rattled on, Pete, your turn. Oh, um, yeah, that, I mean, that makes me think of the, uh, the Flan O'Brien book, the, the Third Policeman, which people might be familiar with. It's often used in these sort of examples, um, where it's a community in Ireland, um, where, where people, the, the policemen basically use their bicycles so often that the, that the bicycles became the policemen and the, the policemen became bicycles. Uh, it's quite surreal, but it does take you, you down a sort of an imaginative journey of that connection between the things that we interact with. Um, I think as an, as an artist and as a ecological artist, we're always looking at ways that we can address some of these issues. So having identified issues such as our disconnection from, from the environment. I mean, one of my big bugbears is that how many people, for example, in the room today could identify a chaffinch. Now, a chaffinch is a bird that is possibly one of the most, is, was when I was a child, the most common bird in the UK. And yet, if you put that in front of a lot of environmental campaigners, they wouldn't know what it was um, in this country. And that's the sort of thing where we don't even know what's on our doorstep. And yet we're going, oh, no, we've got to protect the environment. Yeah, but you don't know the environment. And it's only through engagement with the environment or our local ecologies and our specific local ecologies that we can really, I, I believe, start to address those issues. Um, so I think the, the interest and, and what came out very, very quickly working with Joni is her interest in community and parish was, was seeing different um, sort of political structures that exist in the world and have existed for many, many years, such as Aboriginal culture in Australia, where their whole method of living and thought is based around and within the ecology that they live, their understanding of all the animals, birds, species that they interact with and how they can symbiotically, don't know like that word particularly because it's overused, but anyway, um, that, that we can interact with things can allow us to, to work better with the environment. It's all very, very well saying, oh, well, let's do this law here, which is a sweeping statement about the whole country. And if you look at just the geology of this country, which promotes all the other life forms on top of this country, then how can we make generalized statements about what's best for a particular community? And that community involves every plant, every insect, every bit of mycelium under the ground, which makes up that community. It's not just us. It's not just what that stuff can give to us. It's, it's how we can work with all that stuff. Um, and we have, I guess we have to think in such idealist, idealistic terms um, in the present situation because the crisis is so great. How can we strip back all the, the nonsense that we've created over generations and generations of industrialism and power struggles and things like that to get back to, to something really basis, so, uh, basic. So I think talking to Joni and talking about the importance of, of parishes and, and for, for me, they seem like, well, this is the, the ground root, the root of, of our society um, and decisions should be made from there up. But if this, the par even the parishes don't understand the ecology or possibly the science or the sentiment of a place that we live created by the rocks, the soils, the birds, the bees, the plants, everything that lives there, then how can, how can we make or suggest decisions that can enhance that community that, that we all live in. Um, it's kind of turning everything on its, on its head in a way. So um, I think art as a process is a way that, that we can start to re-engage and we can learn those things. Art as a structure rather than an object. I think it's very, very difficult and very ambitious um, for artists to put up a painting and say, or for example, or a sculpture, and say, well, this is addressing something unless there's some kind of interaction with that and some kind of engagement, physical engagement with it. I think the, the options are limited, but art is a big, a big area to work in, especially when it starts combining with other subjects. Um, I was trying to lead it back into you then, Joni. 
um, I thought, thought the, the um, remarkable service onto parish councils really leads us into our um, our next slide. Actually, the next and the slide after that, we we'll see how we go because I think we've might have covered a, a whole chunk of it. But um, uh, I can we kind of um, titled this one flesh. Because I think one of the things that Pete is alluding there to is the way in, you know, the, the way that our communities and you know our eco the ecologies that we're situated, our communities are situated in, are kind of one flesh. And you mentioned the book, I'm gonna mention the book as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me, this time last year I read a book called Bark Skins, I think it was called. And basically, um, you thought the book was about some families that um that moved or that uh whose ancestors, forebears, um, uh, were early settlers in um, in uh, Northern America. But um, but you quickly realise that actually the book is really about the forest, um, the uh, the forests that were destroyed in um, uh, in North America and Canada, and, the, and how that sort of that forest destruction spilled out into other. Spaces. It's, I very much recommend it. It's a beautiful book. Um, but one of the things that the book was kind of flagging was or, or raising, and I don't know about the veracity of this or not. I'm not a I'm not a biologist. I don't, you know, but it kind of it makes a kind of a um, maybe it's confirmation bias. Maybe it fits so nicely with my particular worldview that I want this to be true, even if it's not. Although it's very sad, very sad. But one of the things that they um, that the book argued is that um or made the case about is the the um the, the medicinal plants that the um the north american indians you um uh made or the medicines that they made from the plants that were available in the you know in their forest forest environment that um that they got their potency or they got their whatever it was that was was really medicinal partly from each other you know it wasn't just the I don't know this plant I don't know I'm just going to say arnica I don't even know where it grows in North America which is awful um but this plant has these properties it's like actually this plant according to this book has these properties in conjunction you know with these other plants that grow that that grow there because because the plants kind of are talking to each other communicating with each other they're all part of this specific ecology that then means that actually it has it goes on still this you know it it has these amazing properties that's still making it sound like almost as if the plants are good for their utility for us for medicines and that's not what i'm meaning the point that I'm trying to make very inelegantly, the point I'm trying to make is about the question about whether our environment, our the ecologies that we're based in, whether that is whether that is all about elements, siloed elements that just do stuff, or actually about whether the things that are really good and really amazing about our ecologies, the things that that, that we're in, um, uh, it is about how all of the in everything within that particular space, the natural, you know, the various elements of the natural environment, the people that are in that place, the communities that are set up around, uh, you know, around, you know, the geologies, of course, which which at the very foundational level literally allow the kinds of shape that the community was going to evolve through and things like that whether actually they're all so deeply connected and interconnected but, um, that in my mind, I'm kind of thinking about this as a bit like one flesh. And one of the things that I feel, and Pete earlier was talking about how we want, you know, we want to protect the environment, but we don't even know what a chaffinch is or whatever, um, and what it, you know, what it looks like and what it does and things like that. Um, one of the, you know, um, it reminds me about some of the HF2 kinds of questions, which is, you know, um, uh, we're going to cut down some ancient woodland, but it's fine because we're going to plant a new woodland somewhere else. Oh, this is also a G7 thing, isn't it? Cut down some ancient woodlands, but we're going to plant new stuff, um, which is forget, which is imagining that the youth, that the, that 
um, which is completely overlooking this whole ecological, fleshy, interactiveness between our Earth, our our biological environment, our communities, our people, our built environment, the economies that we develop around it. I've rattled on. I think that I should shut up now. It's your turn, Pete. I don't know. I think something that, that comes up for me when when you're when we're talking about things like this is language, um, and how um, it's so hard to express a lot of these things because our language has been formulated over many, many, many generations based on a worldview that is is sort of opposed to what we're proposing. So it is quite difficult. Um, to express what we're trying to say because it's just not built that way you know it, it with the language is disjointed it's disconnected in some way I mean we, we can only do our best and I guess things like poetry and things try to do that by allowing space for us to think about those those things um, in 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 those gaps that we create you know it's um our, ho our whole language is is a bit squiffy really isn't it and the sort of the, the differences, you know, how, how do you express, how does a butterfly express itself? And it certainly isn't through words, you know, if we're going to say, let's listen to nature, let's, what language does it use? It's not English, it's not 21st century English, you know, it doesn't say awesome. And it's, it's sort of, um, those are the, the kind of challenges which I'm, I'm interested in, in, in getting to, it sort of, and exploring through things how how do the rocks speak how do how does a chaffinch talk it doesn't talk in our language you know and if we're listening to it we say all oh, no birds and animals they don't speak they you know how can we listen to them how can we work together with something that doesn't doesn't speak um in our language um and so it is it is a challenge and i think there's a you know there's a, also a lot of time for silence isn't there and things like that so that we can get to grips with those things how can we really deeply deeply engage and listen on on its terms on everything's terms um to the world that we live in and and again it's how can we create structures human structures um thought structures so that that they allow us to access the things that we need to know now that we need to to find out to address these challenges. You know, they might not be physical decisions, they might be emotional decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to be be open to all those things. I, I mean, I get I I enjoy how science enriches the world um, and our understanding of the world, but I, I appreciate its limitations. Um, it, it can't involve emotional things. It can't, I mean, maybe I'm overgeneralizing again, but there's language for you. It's um so how, how can they combine? And if they're all seen as separate, how can they they offer um, ways forward? It's there's there's two there's just um, yeah, Descart had a lot to answer for, didn't he? But um, yeah, I, does that lead you anywhere, Joni? Am I going completely off the track now? Do you want to talk about the project that we we devised? Do we just to be yeah, introduced? I'm, I'm just trying to. Okay, I'm just trying to go to the next slide because it, it very much does. And I think, um, uh, and you were talking a, a bit about um, about how we don't even know how a lot of the world around us kind of communicates, and that reminded me a little bit about how you know we're starting we're starting to um, we're starting to uh, find evidence that actually even things like trees talk to each other. You know, we imagine the plant world as being complete, you know, actually totally non sentient and all this kind of stuff, but actually we might have to completely re re um reevaluate our idea about things like communication and stuff like that and it sort of strikes me that really whether we know whether we realize it or not we're actually you know as we're living our lives we are communicating quite heavily with um with the, the fabric of our ecology you know of, with you know if we imagine the places that we're in, the places that our communities are in as a kind of fabric, you know, we are actually communicating with that fabric, whether we are aware 
of that communication or not whether and whether we're listening to it or not and I'm uh, so Pete was mentioning about how we uh, we it's really difficult to um kind of it's it's quite difficult to find a language um about how um how we encourage people to listen and to be open enough to their environment but to be able to be able to have these kind of like deep conversations about it which but that's something that we wanted to do we wanted to um we wanted to explore how people situated themselves in their environment how they lived in their environment what they thought about it how they felt about it how you know what some of the how those how those communities had kind of developed um so the community that we've got here um also so what we just started to do is invite people um not just for a half a day you know traditional traditional um traditional academic research we kind of go okay right let's meet up in a nice place for for an hour and have a recorded chat you can share with me all of this stuff that you want to um but we wanted to do something that was a lot more in depth and that invited our participants at some level um, to start to move beyond this kind of sort of surface level engagement to be able to at least think about listening to the places, um, uh, the non-human places that they were in, um, and which is part of what I absolutely adore about Pete's art and that it's literally painting with you know painting with the the basic molecular fabric that we um that we are made out of mm. yeah I mean um yes yeah, so I, I guess we're looking at, at the slide as well I'm just going to mention um friend Pat has just joined joined the group and made a comment about how it's important that we we step back um quite a bit and that our human arrogance another one of my bugbears is that we can't carry on believing that that we're in charge and that we can understand everything there's no way that the human race can understand the universe you know we can understand little bits that may be appropriate to us um, and on different levels but it's very very difficult to see that so thanks pat for your comment um that yeah we have to step back um and allow nature to to be a bit bigger in our consciousness um, I think what's, what we can sort of look at here, this is a uh, Giva Tin Mine. So our first um, workshop, day workshop, um, was at, in the community of Pendine. And as Joni was saying, we invited uh, parish councillors and tried to get the parish involved as well. I think we had two members of the parish council came along. Uh, we had an ecologist, we had an educational person, we had a geologist with us on the day. Um, not a great number, but it was a lovely number because it allowed us to talk a little bit more deeply. And, and I guess the idea was to, to share ideas on a sort of a quite an equal footing. OK, we were facilitating this workshop, um, but looking at people's emotional relationship, their personal understandings and just kind of creating um, a kind of a group sense of where we all lived and our relationship to that. Um, as a sort of a starting point, like, okay, well, if we can work out where we are now and what our knowledge is, um, then we can take a, another step forward from that a, as a group. So that was the kind of idea that we were looking at historical knowledge that we that we might have, understandings of the way the community has evolved from pre, you know, from prehistory. Pending, there's been people living there for about ten thousand years. We've got the some of the oldest working field networks in the world um, around that area. Um, we've got wells um, and then obviously the mining has come in. Uh, it's quite hard to imagine what it would have been like 10,000 years ago um, because it's been so blitzed by mining, something that, that the Cornish um, kind of celebrate as part of the heritage, obviously. Um, but when you look at the environmental stuff that's happened around it, it, it does get interesting, but then you put that in perspective, it's a tiny part of, of the whole. Um, again, there's a lot of interesting issues around um, 
how we're interwoven with the fabric of our communities through, through the mining. But um, in Pendine, through doing the research in, into the pigments, you find out that you know we're in one of the most radioactive um, granite centers in the world, but that is what's given it all the minerals that, that are abundant in the area that has led to the, uh, the mining industry, that has led to the sense of community and identity that we have, we have abundant arsenic, which is, you know, it's an interesting perspective to put, how, how has that affected everybody? Um, and just looking at the, the presence of these different things. And um, I remember one of the things which really struck you on, in our first conversation, Joni, was when I said, well, you know, it, when you bring stuff up from underground prematurely, um, then it's not ready to be there. Um, and it hasn't oxidized out. And so you get a lot more um, poisonous things. Con well, we, we call it contamination. I guess it is because we have had a hand in it. So we can contaminate something through this. Um, but yeah, so you, you start to see where you're living a little bit differently when you start to understand the fabric of where we are. And, and as Joni was saying earlier, we are absorbing this quite physically through the water that we have. Um, through just being in these places. I mean, we're all aware of radon in our houses, but there must be a, a, low, a higher level of radiation that we're all importing. And then we're going, oh no, a mobile phone mask is going up. Well, just come and live in West Cornwall. You know, it's not, there's no relationship that the, the um, just these sort of ideas and getting a different understanding, a different viewpoint. Personally, I like geology because it gives you an incredible sense of perspective of time I mean, the, the, the granite in West Cornwall came up to the surface about 320 million years ago through rocks that were 420, were laid down underwater 420 million years ago, south of the equator. And it's kind of, so all these things have happened over such, and then, and then we think we're important. You know, we, we haven't been here for very long. Um, so when you start looking at that and the immense forces and power that nature in the form of geology, in the form of weather systems, in forms of the sea, we align ourselves with that and see ourselves as part of it. How much power does that give us? How much energy? You know, we're part of this and, and we have grown out of this immense process of change and transformation and volcanic eruptions and mass, you know, continental plates bashing into each other and rising up five miles into the air and crashing down again going down eight miles underground. And this is what we are. We are incredibly, uh, it's, it's just miraculous. I, I, every day I can um, tune into that idea of the power and wonder of nature that we're all part of. Um, and so when, when we're seeing well in our little world of, oh, how much money am I gonna make this month? And how am I gonna get to finish my paper this month or whatever, you know, and it's like, you know, come on, sit back and, and breathe it all in and, and just put things in perspective a bit. So I think these sort of projects can enable, uh, can enable, can help us do that, can see our place in the world a little bit better. Um, and then once we can, alike, can, can understand that, maybe we can start making um, decisions, political, environmental, whatever decisions. Maybe they are, our decisions are to do nothing, to step back. I know in North Devon where I, I was living before, we have coastal defense issues and the whole thing is about how can we stop the sea like King Canute, you know, and it's just like, you're right, you're not going to, you know, it's a lot bigger than we are and it doesn't matter what we do, it's moving in on us and that's irrespective of, of climate change, that's just the natural process, you know, and we have to just uh, stop wasting resources on fighting nature and trying to dominate it um, and become part of it and, and move with it. So. Um, yeah, so the project essentially was a way of us to to get a little bit more aligned with that, but also just, yeah, I think we do have a very deep emotional relationship with the places that we live um, and the communities that we live in, acknowledging where they came from, acknowledging all the 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 effort and pain and suffering and joy that, that took us to the place that we are today and the privilege that we can actually live safely in these places. Um, I think that's a very beautiful thing that, that can come out of, of sharing that with a diverse group of people. Um, it's just seeing where everything came from sort of thing. 
I'm, I'm very aware that we've only got like we only really have about seven minutes before we ought to at an absolute stretch we ought to come back to you all um so i'm going to skip through a couple of a couple of these slides because we've kind of we're kind of covering everything oh but i also have to say one of the things i adore about the conversation is that we oh god i can't look there we go um one of the things that i also really adore about the kinds of conversations that we've been having um is like is are these things like these questions about um questions about temporality about time um and the idea of the idea of rocks as being fluid because that's basically what pete's geological work or one of the what you know what um uh, kind of brings to this that it's you know we uh we're kind of okay with the idea that people and the things that that we the way that we shape the planet and stuff like that is kind of bit fluid over time but actually even the very the even the kind of the ge the fixities the geographical foundations the things that we imagine are completely rigid are um are fluid if we extend the way we look at time enough anyways i'm just like i'm just writing one um, so uh so a couple of uh, just in this slide we're talking about positionality because we're just trying to think about how people situate themselves um uh how, how people situate themselves with, within communities um and uh this is our penultimate slide so i think this is probably a good place to um have a bit more of a conversation on um because this is where we were um so, so after we took um uh, our participants on a walk um over the morning and had a chat about the environment so like walked through the place had a discussion about the place, explored how the place had developed, how it had grown um, from uh, from uh, um, the the kinds of subsistence that people gained out out of out of it to the way that the communities had developed and the things that the communities and local cultures had, that had emerged from it. Um, and in the afternoon, we invited participants to, um, in Pete's words, make marks on paper or canvas or something, um, and uh, um, and have a conversation about um, about the things that matter to them, um, uh, the, thing, the things that matter to participants as a part of how. Um, their communities emerged over time. Um, and, and yeah, Pete, over to you. We've got about, just about four minutes. Okay, so the previous slide was, was the pigments um, that have collected in, in Cornwall. Um, so this is what we were talking about, selection of nine colours. Um, something that I find very sort of important about these if you go to visit any sort of earth-based community around the world then this is the palette that we're all using um, and so there's a very sort of connected thing about these colors now these colors come from mining waste and from natural landforms um, and so i think the idea of the can you move to the next slide again Joni? i don't know if i can do that um, so the idea is like we would introduce the the materials um and then then i would do a little bit of talking about well how since we've been living in caves we've been making paint out of these materials and what these materials were their ages how they've developed any social history surrounding them and then then the idea of of painting and using this this process that the group was an artist we're not it was not a group of artists it was a group it was just a, a random a self-selected group of uh, of the local community um and i think it was uh, bertolt brecht who who sort of highlighted how through discomfort we can discover um new things um through art and things like that so there was certainly part of it that that you put people in a place that is slightly uncomfortable okay you're all going to do a painting now Ah, I haven't done any painting since I was at school. I can't paint, blah de blah de blah. So and it's like now, shut up, I say, get on with it. You know, and so we took people through a process. There's something about earth pigments, there's something about being involved in that, because in the mornings we sometimes collected the pigments, taking people through that process. I'm not saying here's a range of colours from WH Smith's, do a painting like Leonardo da Vinci. 
it's not about that at all. Um, and so it's about a, a, it's kind of a central communal experience of um, sharing ideas. So we, we basically took people through through a process um, and a, a system. Um, I think the first time we were taking people through geolo geological time. And so we're saying, okay, make some marks or some images which represent um, Pendine before there was any, you know, geologically. So then we built a structure. And then I think we went to, and now when there was plant life, so representing plant life. Okay, now let's introduce some animal life. Now let's introduce um, humanity into that environment, etc. And then we ended up with the future. So we we're kind of making a, a map, quite an abstract map, using that environment um, to talk through those things. And it, it, it just freed everything up. Conversation moved in very, very different directions. And, and although we didn't record any of the decisions that, that we, we possibly made through this, I think that people took away a different shared vision of, of where they were living and maybe their interaction with it. Um, and we did end up with some beautiful paintings at the end, but I mean, I can see them as beautiful because I'm, I'm allowed to, but uh, it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it was a very liberating process. Oh, here's one. Um, so this is from Goran Haven, um, where we went. There was a, yeah, that was a great day. Do you want to talk a little bit more about how we sort of summed up? Yeah, just, just extremely, extremely briefly, because um, uh, I really want to, I really want to look at the Padlet. I haven't seen it yet. And I want to see how it's kind of developed. And I want to have conversations, you know, I want to invite everybody else to have a conversation as well. But, um, but from a, an academic research perspective, um, uh, the um, the work that we that the um, the work that or well, some of the work that we've done we've uh, well, has has well, uh, I've used as research in um, uh, in a large project that um, that I've now completed. Um, which has been really, really good, um, and we're in the process of the early stage, the early stages. But we are in the process of putting together a um, a journal article, just exploring um, exploring some of the questions that we've been talking about, um, and thinking about how, you know, what does this mean for research, or certainly what does this mean for a kind of like participatory ecological kind of community based research. Pete, you look like you were itching to come in then. Oh no, um, no. I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, in, I'm intrigued. I'm not an academic, um, and it, it's. I love working. I mean, I have I have done an MA and things like that, but uh, it always concerns me where this research goes and how this then steps back out in into the community again, um, whether it stays within academia. So I'm kind of. That's a kind of a final question for me. How do we take this back out again um, into the world? Um, and it's also been really e exciting, if a little frustrating, to take this project um, online as well, that we did two online workshops during, during the last year, didn't we? Which, which I think were very successful. I don't know if anybody is, is here. I know that, that Sarah, you took part in it, didn't you? So, um, but yeah, and it was amazing that we could still do it through through this this medium um, people went out and gathered stuff themselves and then brought it back and then we all made and shared uh, what we were making online um, so yeah but yeah it has in fact I mean I'm, I'm looking forward to where it goes next Joni and yeah I'm interested in making the making the working on this paper because um, yeah I've not done one of those yet so yeah it'd be great I've also got a couple of other ideas, Pete. We need to have a little, a really quick chat as well. Not right now, but um, soon. Very like today, if we can. Okay, what's this here then? Okay, what's what where? This Padlet thing. Tell ah, us all yes. about. Okay, that. so I'm going to stop this share, and I'm going to I'm going to share the Padlet. It was up just now, but yeah. Okay, is that sharing? It's sharing on top of the of the previous one. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can see the Padlet, Joni. Oh, that's cool. 
That's great. Um, uh, what I was hoping is that in the remaining 13 minutes, I don't know, does, does anybody want to talk about what you've written on the Padlet? Oh no. Sorry, Jodie, it seems to have disappeared again. <laughs> we now got your PowerPoint back. I know. Ah, I'm but so sorry about this. Um, it, it, yeah. Um, does anybody want? Who, does anybody want to say to say anything? Contribute? Um, talk about what you wrote on the Padlet? And I am going to share the screen again. There we go. Does that pink plus sign do anything in the bottom? Oh no, that adds things, doesn't it? Yeah. They're not so, a full, full screen thing. Sorry? They're not a full screen button for it. No, um, you, you have to scroll down, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I'm just looking to see if anybody's sort of popping up into the chat, but so failing that, let's have a little read through what people have said. Oh, it's disappeared again. It's my fault. I keep on doing something different. Um, uh, so somebody said, engaging with the environment, um, thanks for the fascinating presentation. And it strongly resonates with our Clist Valley Regional Park aspirations to engage people and parishes with their environment and their heritage. Um, everything communicates and how do we create um, silence to hear it speak? I, I'm, uh, I'm wanting to ask if, um, if you've actually, you know, if you, how you, how you respond to that question about how you create the spaces to hear the places speak. I don't know whether, I'm looking to try to find the chat, but for some reason I can't actually get it, which is really, oh, Nat Craig has raised a hand. Hello, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself, but um, thank you. Yeah, I, I wrote that about everything communicates. It's uh, I was writing it as you were speaking and then you sort of went into talking about the work and the, the uncomfortableness. And I'm a type of person that definitely feels, in the past has filled in the gaps when there's silence. So I like to talk and find the answers and da da da. And I see that really common in spaces of academia, um, you know, and in spaces of business and organizations. And I love art, artistic spaces because they, they don't require that from me as much, but I, I just really interested. I, I mean, I think, as I said in my um, thing that you've really answered it, but just hearing a little bit more about that uncomfortable nature and how, you know, how you've both navigated that in different ways, because Pete, I'm sure you also experience people trying to talk all the time as well. So how you navigate that uncomfortableness of too much noise and not enough noise. I think it's interesting. I think that our expectations of silence are quite limited as well. Um, that sometimes that we can be just walking through things. I mean, it's, um, I think that an example is like when I'm out in nature and everyone's like, oh, you've got to be really quiet in nature. Whenever I take my kids out there, I just want them to scream their heads off. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is, that's a form of silence. That's a form of engaging fully with it. I mean, obviously I don't want to upset other people through them screaming their heads off, but it, it's just this, this expectations of way to, ways to behave and ways to be quiet. It's like, oh, to be quiet, we've all got to sit cross-legged and go on sort of thing. No, you don't. You can be quiet and peaceful and silent inside in a very different way, you know, by being active, you know, there, there's all different ways of being silent and being silent by being noisy, which sounds crazy, but it's, it's you know, that things come to us through, all sorts of different ways. We're all completely unique in our experience of the world. Um, and so the way that silence and nature and the world can speak to us and can communicate with us, we shouldn't limit it in any way whatsoever. I think that it can be experienced on so many different levels and in different ways and at different times. You know, you might do something today and understand what you did 10 years time, but it's not limiting those things. It doesn't have to be immediate, it doesn't have to be now these things come over time, you know, the, the, the way that we can appreciate it, I suppose. So I guess that's, that would be my response to, to silence and things like that, yeah. 
I like talking a lot as well. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose also um, uh, one of the things that the um, that the painting does is it actually it's, it asks people to invite it invites people to fill the silences with a what might be considered as a more meditative kind of activity and you know, maybe when people are um so it kind of helps to make silences a bit more comfortable sometimes you know sometimes when people are doing the painting they are you know they're just you know they are quiet because they're thinking about what they're doing and then they might be come up with a come up with something else yeah um come up with a with uh, a set of thoughts that then they articulate and a conversation starts and things like that. Mm. I want to go to Sarah and then to John in the, we've, we've got literally seven minutes left. So I'm just very aware of that. But Sarah, over to you. Sarah, you, do, did you still want, you've got your hand raised. Did you still want to come in or? Or should we go to John? Sorry, sorry, I couldn't unmute myself, apologies. Okay, um, uh, hi, I'm Sarah Bohr. I'm an artist who lives in Mid-Devon. I've actually, Pete and I have exhibited recently, uh, actually. Um, uh, I also work using earth pigments and have done some uh, projects uh, with, within the community in the past. There are a couple of points I wanted to make. Firstly, um, Pete was talking about uh, sounds in, in the countryside. I mean, nature is very noisy. I mean, you go out in the morning and there's so much noise with uh, different creatures uh, communicating with each other in their own particular way. So no, it's not a quiet place. Secondly, I wanted to point, it out, point out that um, as an artist living in a rural area, I'm aware of how much power the farming community has locally. They not only shape the countryside, the landscape that we live in, Many of them in a good way, others in not such a good way. They also have a great deal of power on local parish councils about what planning decisions and things are made. And I think this is something that really needs to be looked at. Um, the, the kind of subsidies and grants that they're able to get for things like ripping up stock fencing to replace with brand new stock fencing, ripping up hedges to plant new hedges, Things like being able to concrete their entrances. I mean, we've just had a local farmer who has concreted a three quarter of a mile um, entrance down to a holiday lap, 50,000 pounds. You know, I think these are the sort of things that we need to be, be looking at because these sort of decision making um, decisions don't actually help our rural communities. I so agree, Sarah. <clears throat> um, and I think you've raised a really valuable point there about how just because people work in nature doesn't mean to say that they're of it as well. Um, and it makes me that what you were saying makes me reflect on um, uh, quite a lot of times doing political leafleting and stuff like that. And you have a nose in people's gardens just because it's interesting. And you realize that actually these gardens, these personal green spaces, are um, in terms of biodiversity and stuff like that and the absolute worst thing is when they put um well there's a whole a whole bunch of decking and a little bit of astroturf like really okay um but just and which kind of like really speaks to this divorce that we we're, we're talking about i think and about the way that even when we're doing natural <laughs> really really mess it up um yeah, uh, but also about how powerful some of those voices are too. I just want to go to John, um, and I'm, what I'm hoping is that we'll just have an, a little bit of time just to kind of like sum up very, very briefly at the end. John, did you want to make your point? John, were you going to cut? Were you going to cut? Uh, come in there. Okay. Um, Pete, did you have anything that you wanted to um, to add to um, Sarah's points about 
the role of the farming communities and those kind of different questions? I don't know. I, I, I feel it's often very, it's, it, how, how do we um, not create division between ourselves and the farming community? Um, how do we involve communities that we can point a fig, figure at, finger at, you know, we can go, oh, they're doing this, they're doing that. And it's like, yeah, but how do we engage them? How do we keep, how do we make them on the, see it from our perspective? You know, how do we um, do things that so that we're not go, going, you don't want to do it like that. You want to do it like this because everyone hates that. You know, if you go up to a farm and say, you don't know what you're doing, they're going to put a pitchfork in you, aren't they? Basically, you know, it's just sort of, we can't create these divisions. Um, we have to try and see it from their, from other people's perspective um, and what actions we can do to, to create a commonality between us, you know, a commonality of understanding so that we can share it. You know, it's, there's all, again, it's this, we know what's right attitude, which, which hinders us so much. And that comes from every perspective, you know, that we know, I'm basically saying I know what's right at the moment, but you know, it, it's kind of that, it's that difficulty, isn't it? Okay, we can go to that farm. You can't do that. And he'll say, why, why not? And it's, you know, in the grander scheme of things, bloody blah, it's very hard to, um, to criticize of the farming community because of what they do actually do. You know, that they need to, they need some leeway. I and mean, there's a lot of people in the farming community who are working very um, broadly very positively and very forward thinking you know it's I don't I mean that, that's I guess that's one of the things about parish councils which it's always always puts you off isn't it I remember in our first meeting Joni and, and just like parish councils have a bad thing and I think because it comes down to such fine details um, and people just basically staking a claim in the world and having a fixed point of view I don't know I haven't got any answers to that at all. Um, I don't know, has your attitude towards parish councils um, changed while you've been working with them, Joni? Um, uh, I was just actually reflecting on the really good point that you made about not being too prescriptive and that actually um, one of the things that made me think about is about how important these kinds of conversations are hosting, being having the spaces to be able to have these kind of deep conversations actually are um, to be able to have this kind of not power driven, by the way, you're wrong, I'm right, mm -hmm. and you need to convert yourself to. I've right. always known that, Joni, I've always known that, and I accept that, yes. <laughs> uh, no, but but uh, what, um, but having these these kind of conversations that we've been talking about um, that we do through the through our collaboration um, feels to me a bit of a, a space where people can um, explore other ideas and explore and question our own practices as well. Actually, and that, um, our own the ways that we imagine the world too. I'm very conscious that we're out of time. So we ought to pass hands back over to the organisers. Um, but thank you, um, Muraz. Thank you ever such a lot for having us. Um, it's been a I've had a really enjoyable conversation. I hope, um, I hope thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> Joni and Pete, thank you so much. Um, but, um, I just we're at time, so I just wanted to share um, a few observations. Uh, the role that I have at the university is thinking about the relationship across university and communities and some really good points been raised this morning. Um, I think the way that Pete and Joni met through the serendipity, there was a melting pot session and they got on well and saw opportunities to work together and thinking about how can we create greater or more frequent moments of serendipity and that kind of balance of the good fortune of that up against uh, the strategic planning and working at scale and sort of tackling the octopus and, and how those two things sit next to each other. And then, of course, there's the pressure of uh, being very outcome driven within uh, the university. And I think, again, Pete and Joni illustrate very beautifully the importance of following a thread of thought and having space to explore. And that will lead you 
to un unanticipated ways of thinking and making space for those moments is really important and very difficult when everything has to be so outcomes driven all the time. So there can be a real tension sitting in those spaces. And finally, I think Pete, you made uh, the great point about where this learning then goes. You have these rich collaborations and it's really important that what comes out of that doesn't stay in an academic bubble, that there, it, it's facing in both directions so that that learning is shared uh, through journals and conferences and publications and also through exhibitions and events and hopefully events like this um, so that those conversations can continue off the back of that. So um, uh, you've raised uh, lots of, of great topics through your talk, so thank you. Um, uh, Helen has just kindly put the links uh, for the next session um, in the bottom. So uh, that wraps up our morning. We are back at one o'clock uh, to hear about the Tidelines project. And that's the first of two sessions this afternoon. So, and do please contact the research, research events team if you can't find your links. Um, and so just final thanks uh, to Joni and Pete and Neil and Martha uh, for their presentations this morning. And we will see you all in about 90 minutes.